going to start today with Woodshop, but first we're just going to kind of go over how Makehaven works, badging, kind of all that. Hello. Um, and then we'll get into like, you know, the Woodshop and tools specifically. So uh, with that, <laughs> so helpful. There we go. All right. Oh, there's a slide for what we're going to go over this week. Um, so yeah, mostly this week we'll be going over Woodshop, how things work, how Makehaven works. I know not everybody's a new member, so like some of this will be repeat, but it's good to know. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. So getting Makehaven badges. You need these to turn on the machines. Don't worry, I'm not going to just read slides the whole time. Um, so when I think everybody's done their orientation at this point, right? Yeah. So you've kind of seen you know, that has everybody seen like the board of facilitators that's on the wall. And I love pointing that out. Um, most of the machines need badges. That's just kind of a universal statement. I think um, you don't need a badge. I don't think for a hammer. I think we trust everybody to be able to figure out how a hammer works. Um, but most of the machines that have any like risk level really require a badge. And the way I usually describe this, we don't, this is not how Makehaven describes this, but it's how my brain works. So it's kind of like three levels. There's like level zero, which is hammers. You could just use a hammer. You don't need to do anything special about it. Um, level one is you watch a video on the website and then you take a little quiz and it automatically applies the badge to your, your account. And then level like two is you do the video, you do the quiz, and then you come in and you check out with a facilitator. So that could be Jared. There's actually a lot of woodshop facilitators. So I think there's one every day except for Sunday, but we don't have anybody on Sunday. So yeah, he's Saturday. Yeah. Um, cause he always does a pen class right afterwards. Um, so you come in, you check out with a facilitator, which is really just kind of like in many ways going over the same stuff that you see in the video, but it's like, it's hands-on. Um, making literally nothing if we're not hands-on. So <laughs> it's important, you know, it's, I find it valuable. To like actually touch the thing and push the buttons and you know whatever um i'm here to help you get that done if you have questions if you have trouble getting set up we will often and this will be the case throughout the the course is that like i will sometimes for stuff that is often a bottleneck you know stuff that we have less facilitators for or just you know is only one week i'll often like block off time for a facilitator that's just foundations. Mm -hmm. So anybody in the group who wants to show up and it's fun to do it as a group, you know, especially if you've never touched, uh, you know, whatever it is. Um, so you can kind of come in at that time. You can of course always schedule on your own, but you can come in at that time and, you know, do it together. There's some stuff that we will do intentionally together, like screen printing. When we do, when we get to that section, we'll put some time together, probably like a Saturday, Sunday afternoon and one weekday um evening where we can come in and like we'll all screen print a foundations t-shirt I did a bag last cohort you know whatever you want to do but we'll kind of do it together um some stuff we'll do in person we'll do like electronics will be mostly in person um mostly because we find that that's like the section that people have the most trouble with so doing it all together will thank you um is just easier and we'll all do the same thing together so that's, that's all that. That's, I just said more words for the same thing. And every week I'll put up, and if I ever forget, please don't hesitate to remind me, I'll put a link to the slides up on, on the Slack as well. And I think I put it in all of the automated emails, but again, also I have automated emails set up to send out every week. Let me know if you don't get them one week, because it means that my math on doing dates went awry. And that's not impossible. So just, just if you don't get an email every Friday, somebody let me know. Um, all right. So with that, I will start to hand it over to Jared and Corey whenever you want to chime in on the wood shop and how wood works. The wood works too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually I'm gonna uh, cheat. Uh, can you hear jared okay 
Uh, a little soft, but um, but can hear him. All right. Small one. Um, so my background is mostly electromechanical, um, machinist, welder, but I dabble in wood. So I'm I'm not like the greatest uh, woodworker at making, but um, I'm more than proficient. Um, so I don't know all the ins and outs, but I will definitely get you there. Um, so a quick intro to wood materials. You know, we all know what wood is. It comes from trees, right? Um, can break that down into a, a few different types, um, hardwood, softwoods, plywoods. Um, they all have different uses. Um, if you live indoors, you probably know softwoods. That's fine. Behind this sheet rock is fine. It's cheap, it's fast to grow, it's it's relatively easy to, to uh, work with. Um, but if you go to Home Depot and buy two by fours or something like that, and you look and it does this, mm -hmm. twists and turns and bends. And, um, so that's kind of the drawback of soft woods. The hard woods, uh, a lot more pretty. You make um, furniture or something nice, a nice green to it. Um, a little more durable, but it's a little harder to work with. So there's trade-offs for each different type of wood. Uh, plywoods, uh, they take a log, they put a sharp blade on it, and they turn the, the log very slowly, and it shears off a thin sheet of that log. It's kind of cool to watch it shear it down and get smaller and smaller and smaller. They take those big sheets, and they glue them together, and they sandwich it in different directions. And that makes plywood. Um, you can also take chips of wood, oriented strand board OSB, and they, they glue all the little pieces together. And plywood is a whole nother section. Um, just like the differences between hardwoods and softwoods, there's a different use and, and for each different type of plywood. Um, I have a boat, so uh, marine grade plywood, they use a different kind of glue. So when it gets wet, it doesn't fall apart. Like half my phone is right now. <laughs> really really use that. Um, yeah, that's all. Like plywoods are a whole nother uh, um, subject, but for the most part, the first delineation of woods is hardwoods and soft. So, what are some examples of when you would use a hardwood versus a softwood? Um, used for finding work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Anything uh, decorative, anything that you're going to see the grain, um, I would use a hardwood. And, you know, there's different hardwoods. Poplar, if you go to Home Depot, uh, poplar is a real uh, popular uh, choice. It's a hardwood, but it's, it's, it's very easy to work with and it's cheap, but it is technically a hardwood. Um, something like oak, maple, if you want to make a cutting board, you can make a cutting board out of pine, but it's probably not going to last very long because it's not going to look as nice. So um, yeah, and softwoods um, usually used to make something cheap, not cheap, but um, inexpensive. Um, if it's going to be covered up or painted, uh, fine is a good choice. Um, what else can you use softwoods for? So like the old floors in my house are probably hardwood because they're like yeah, they're the hardwood, really pretty. Well. If were someone to refinish them, they'd be very pretty, right. <laughs> like where you can see all the grains and whatnot. Yeah, I did live in an apartment that had pine floor. Uh, they do make soft, soft wood flooring. Yeah. Um, and it is a little less durable, so it picks up nicks and, and things and stuff like that, but it's easier to finish. Um, a lot of the, the wood, like hardwoods, uh, like I said, I have a boat, so I use teak, teak. Uh, grows in soil that has a lot of silica in it. So it picks up that soil and it, it has a really high abrasion resistance because it has a lot of silica in it. So just as an example, so different types of wood, they have different characteristics based on how they're grown, where they grow, stuff like that. It's almost like wine. But, um, a lot of wine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, cutting boards, we make a lot of cutting boards here. Those are good first projects. Um, a lot of maple. Is really hard. Um, stands up good to cutting on. Yeah, all right. 
I'm just happy the button works. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I do love a good glue. Um, so connecting wood, uh, a lot of times we want to make something bigger than a single piece of wood so we need to connect wood somehow. Um, first thing people think of, a little wood glue. Um, wood glue gets into the pores of the wood and it kind of soaks in and joins the two. And like it says, sometimes it's stronger than the wood itself. You glue two pieces of wood together, you try to break it and the wood will break before the glue bond does. Um, depends on the type of glue. Um, there is a million and one different types of glue. You ask a hundred woodworkers what the best glue is, you'll get a hundred and one different answers. <laughs> there are glues made from animal hides. They stink like they're made from- That's animals. pretty gross, actually. Yeah. Yeah. They work really well for certain, certain things. Um, certain glues are more waterproof than others. Um, I use epoxy, which is not really a glue, but it's, uh, it works pretty good with some kinds of wood. Um, so do not try to glue to fill gaps. My dad taught me a mm. trick. He takes some sawdust and he mixes it with wood glue and pack it in there and then actually will fill a little bit. Uh, um, I definitely bit. filled gaps with oh, yeah. glue. Yeah, yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. What goes wrong? Uh, the, a typical wood glue, like type one or something like that, it's, it's, it's very moist, so when it dries, it shrinks a lot. So if you if fill a gap with wood glue, it looks great, and then it dries, and it'll pull it apart. And yeah, somehow worse than when you started. <laughs> yeah, fair. Yeah, fair. Um, screws and nails. Uh, I like screws because they tend not to back out like nails do in certain applications. Um, there's some really cool jigs we have. To a, a jig is something to. Um, fixture two parts or, or multiple parts together so you can put a screw through it. So we have a, a jig that puts an angled hole. So if you have a flat piece of wood against a flat piece of wood and you want to screw it in from this side, it makes a perfect angle You put the screw in and it'll screw it together. And then you put a little plug in there and cut off the plug and hide it. Nobody ever sees the screw. So screws are nice. Um, screws take a little bit more time and a little more energy to Faster than the nails do. So that's why two by fours, you see the, the carpenter and they have a bag full of nails and they're just pounded in them uh, real quick. Um, little finished nails, little, you know, little tiny nails are good for putting things together while you're gluing. Um, that's another use for nails. Um, so realistically, like a house should be done with screws. With that. So like realistically, like a house should be made with screws, not nails to hold together better. Should? Well, I mean, just like, like if nails yeah. are gonna, cause like, I don't know if everybody else has experienced nail pops in their yeah. like ceiling and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So like. This yeah. is a great question for Lior, nails and screws. Nails are really good at fighting when things are pushed sideways and screws are really good at keeping things together. Mm -hmm. It's a weird property of the metal. Yeah, shear versus tension. Gotcha. Okay. Um, nails work by friction and displacing wood. So you, you hammer a nail into a piece of wood. The the wood is trying to grab a hold of the nail, and that friction is what holds the nail in place. Um, so any kind of longitudinal pull on the nail is going to try to pull the nail out. Where a screw uses a thread that digs into the wood, so it actually cuts into the side of the wood and resists pulling out. But yet, you could build a house with screws and it would be much more sound, mm -hmm. but it would cost a lot more. So, or the trade-off of, of being like, you know, 5% stronger, 10% stronger, mm -hmm. would you really need that for that amount of cost? Yeah, that's the, that's the trade-off. Fair. So if you find a mountain of screws, yeah, it just in the woods for free. Right, that's what you build your house with. Otherwise, <laughs> use nails. Okay, sure. got it. <laughs> as far as I know, there's probably other reasons to use nails. I'm sure there's lots fine. of also opinions yeah. of what's better, where. Yeah. Yeah. Um, coming from a machine, like a machinist standpoint, I, nails don't make any sense to me at all. I always use screws. <laughs> <Sure. laughs> um, 
cyanoacrylate, the super glue, uh, connect wood pieces in seconds if you're um, tacking something together real quick and you just need to position it before you can screw it another way or something like that. Super glue works pretty good. Um, and joinery is a whole magical joinery. separate. Yeah. Let's see. Let's. Japanese joinery fascinates me. They build entire houses and temples with like no mess. And it's, yeah, it's yeah. amazing. Wow. They have some incredible complicated uh, joints that they make. Really? Um, Do you actually have to have an. Oh, I guess, you know, we made these links before Twitter turned into whatever it is now. <laughs> All right. So I guess you have to be on Twitter to see. Let me, let's see. One of the fascinating things I think with, with joinery, especially Japanese joinery, is they know the strength of the grain of the wood. So the, the grain works well in some directions and not others. And the way they cut these joints, they um, really use the strengths of that direction to make mm -hmm. the, the joint. Yeah. I can explain if you don't see it. Yeah, there's, but there's like, I mean, there's a million different types of joints that can be made that like some are. I'm going to use the word simple, and I want you all to know that this is all <laughs> magic as far as I could tell. Um, but, you know, there's, is this a dovetail? Is this close? Kind of. So kind of? No, no, no. Yeah, all right. <laughs> you would, it's kind of rounded. It has the same idea of a dovetail, that it slots together and you can't pull it out. Yeah. But that kind of style is usually because they use a router or some kind of special tool. Oh, fair. Like, you could do that on the Shapoko. Yeah. And that would do. Yeah. Let's see. No. Yeah, so, so I think there's a, yeah, I think there's a whole nother, I think there's a whole section on joinery somewhere in here, but yeah, the, the simple idea is that one piece goes into another piece and yeah, it just holds on. And I definitely clicked on this because there was this, yeah, there's just a bunch of different types of joinery. Um, there's like simple stuff. This is, this is, I think how every Ikea piece of furniture <laughs> is created. Uh, like um this is you know you would just i think end up like just gluing this together um angles uh, you could add a third piece there's just so much i mean like there's so many different types of, yeah, of joints more complicated with uh, wedges and stuff like that um pins um I think, I mean, people make entire careers out of doing oh, yeah. joinery and it's someday I will find somebody who teaches a joinery class mm. and I will lock them in the back room <laughs> so they can't leave us. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that is definitely one of the, one of the fancier ways I think of, of joining one. Let's see. Oh, are we already there? I forgot how few slides there are for this one. So some good, some good starter projects. I know I'm just reading the guys that are out there, but we're going to be on woodworking for two weeks, but don't, it's your first project for foundations. So like, don't go nuts. Don't go nuts. There's time to go nuts later. Um, and, you know, we talked a bit about cutting boards. That is an excellent first project, whether you do just like, just a couple pieces or a bunch of pieces. You could do end grain cutting boards, which is a whole extra level of fancy. Um, correct, either of you correct me if I get part of this wrong, but, and this was fascinating to me when I learned it, that like wood is just a bunch of straws together. So when I, we should have brought some wood up so I could like point it out, but if the end grain is like, if I just had like a piece of wood and I, cut it off that's the end and I'm looking at the grain of the edge of the piece and you could just like if you get that wet it'll just soak the water in because it's just like a bunch of little tubes that are you know super tiny of course um so when you do an end grain cutting board you're cutting all these little pieces so that those straws are kind of facing up which is great for how it looks because when you're cutting through it, you're not going to see those marks. 
Because you're just cutting. Imagine if we just had a straw. If I just cut the straw, it still looks like a straw, right? But if I lay that straw down and I cut across the straw, now, well, I have two straws. Um, but, you know, I can see that. So that's why people do that. But it's a, you know, it's a bunch more work. Um, you could do picture frames. Oh, man, you should definitely get past on the lathe. You yeah. should definitely make like a bowl or... That's what I... Yeah, yeah. I find that really... I've gotten badged on it, but I haven't like had the time to do it. And we just have ones, you know, there's often something I work on it during the day. Um, the one tool in the woodshop I'm not badged on, so. Oh yeah? The lid? Yeah. <laughs> I do the metal lid, but not the wood. All right. I feel like that, I mean, that transition <laughs> is so simple. All right. Oh. But yeah, birdhouses are great. You could just mess around with joinery um, and just like try some desk organizers. Same as the, I, just, I just use my laptop on my computer or on my couch. Um, but yeah, the, you know, for, don't feel like you have to know everything about a wood shop to like go in there and just like start messing around really. Like these are all great examples. It's so weird the cameras there. I'm usually over here. Uh, <laughs> like any of these or just a Google. Honestly, like don't don't feel like you have to make something amazing. And this is gonna go, I think, for all the the sections. Like, don't feel like you have to make something that's perfect. Don't feel like you need to know everything about what you're doing. Um, we're up here. Yeah, I, I don't know half of what I'm doing. Um, I've broken machines in the metal shop <laughs> a lot. It's amazing. We are still nice to me. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Do I went to um, tech high school, and in your freshman year, you go through every shop, you know, see which one that you want to pick. And I remember the carpentry shop. We went through it in uh, a week in carpentry, and we just took wood and just joined them. Just take scraps of wood. You do a butt joint. You do a dovetail with a saw. And I, I think I even still have one of those. So that's yeah. Long time. <laughs> um, just to just to make a joint, and I use it as like a, a bookend. So you know, if you just want to pull it out, just there's always plenty of scrap wood in the uh, the barrels there. If you just want to pick a tool and just yeah, send a bunch of wood through it just to see what it does, that's cool too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought thought we've got some more. Um, that's a weird order. <laughs> Corey, did you leave the project slide? I don't oh. know. I don't know. <laughs> uh but yeah we're gonna next up probably gonna go through a bunch of tools and go quick because there's a bunch of slides i think okay yeah. all right so insider secret this slide belongs at the end <laughs> and now we're all learning together um all right so all of those words are still accurate but let's let's keep going think about the projects while we're looking there you go i love it I love it. That, yeah. that is that is why it was there. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. All right. So let me move. Here's my mouse. I was gonna say, let me move this in some way so you can see better. All right. So I'm not gonna go through all of this because that would be really boring. Um, but oh, here's I was saying end grain. So yeah, like the gray is end grain green is edge grain and that's the face so the, like the biggest part of a piece of wood is the face the straw parts are the end and the edge is the edge that's pretty self-explanatory I feel like we can all sort that out and this just to go one layer deeper in the straw because you think about a tree's anatomy like it's trying to get water from the roots up it really is literally wicking water up along those distances and that impacts like how glue works with it and all sorts of things but the end grain cutting board, everybody likes those. They cost about double online. It's because you basically make a cutting board and then you chop it up to make another cutting board out of it. So it's the next level if you're feeling great about doing the first one. Yeah, you can kind of see that like this is the end grain. So this turns into this. I would take this and then I like cut all those pieces. I rotate them 45. 90. 
uh, 90 degrees, and then I can glue them all together. I have a question about that. Yeah. So if you have an ingrained board that acts like a shrub, is it better to do like the base one? Like, how do you? Play to describe, would you ever use any way to make a cutting board if it acts like a shrub? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know, most cutting boards, you, you seal with like an oil or something like that. Yeah. Um, and like a cutting board, like a wood cutting board, you're not going to put that in the dishwasher. You're only going to wash that. Well, you might put it in the dishwasher and then eventually you get really good. sad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like, yeah, that's even, even honestly, an edge grain cutting board. Anything that's got pieces glued together, you shouldn't put in the dishwasher. And it's because like it'll, part of it is, you know, the wood or the glue will eventually give up. Um, but also the wood will kind of warp and, and whatnot. Yeah. Um, Another technical point, because uh, I love the straw analogy. You take a bunch of straws and cut them and you're looking at all the circles and you try to glue that, the glue is going to touch on just the outer rim of that circle. So if you try to glue two bundles like that, all the glue is going to be maybe touching these circles that are kind of touching each other. So all the glue joint is just going to be on that little tangents where they kind of touch each other, right? If you take that bundle of straws and you cut it down the, the end or the, the side, now you've got long strips of exposed uh, wood and you glue that together. Now you've got long strips that are glued together and touching. So it's pretty much universally recommended never to glue any grain to anything else. Um, there are some exceptions, of course, but uh, yeah. Just, but you're just not going to get a good connection. Right. That makes sense. That's why. Yeah. So these are different again i'm not gonna make y'all just listen to me say the same words that are on the screen but different parts of a log you know end up being called different things it's kind of the mouse is so weird sideways um you know something that's cut from the middle is going to have a different pattern than something that's cut from the side or something that's cut from the edge and i feel like this is what we see a lot is the quarter song. I feel like that's like a really common, probably because you can get, I'm going to guess you can get the most pieces out of it when you cut like that. Um, that like that kind of stuff is a little over my head, but I, I do know that like when you're making a deck, the way the grain is, if you, over time, the wood kind of cups a little bit. If you do it the wrong way, then the cups come up and it traps water and then it ruins your deck. So you always want to have the grain like so there's there's a lot of these little things like that that real woodworkers know. That real real for all the time, yeah. Yeah, um, that, that's when you get into like the later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Week, week two, week two stuff. <laughs> <laughs> when we're real experts about right. it, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then just a little little comparison here for you know a good piece of wood versus a poor piece of wood just based on where, you know, those, you know, where knots are, where the grain is, honestly, like, as you're starting to get into woodworking, it, so long as it's, you know, so long as it's straight, and it doesn't, like, curve like a roller coaster when you look at it, you're probably going to be fine. Like anything else, the more, you know, into the weeds you get, the, the, the pickier you'll get. But for now, like, if you go to Home Depot to pick up some wood, just like, just make sure it's pretty much straight and can be squared, which we'll look at in a minute. Um, For the most part, if, if you're just sticking two pieces of wood together, it should look correct. If Like if you look at those two differences, you can just see from now, you can see one looks kind of better than the other. It's true. Yeah. Um, so, you know, things line up, things kind of merge and look good together. That's probably good enough at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, like I was saying before, don't get... I don't get too caught up in in stuff just like as you start to get used to being in the wood shop and whatnot. Speaking of squaring wood, so squaring wood is when you make all the sides parallel to each other. When the, the sides, these sides are even and these sides are even. That's a really simple way to say it. Um, so when you take off all the all the rough parts so that you can, you know, you can't really work with that, with all the 
bumpy edges and whatnot. I mean, some projects you can, you know, live edge tables and, and whatnot certainly is an option, but for the standard use of a wood, you know, in the wood shop, you're not going to want that. So there's an order in which you do that. If you get a rough cut piece, um, you're going to start with the jointer, a machine I love, but also scares me. It's very powerful. And it definitely almost, it definitely tried to take some of my fingers once. Um, not my fault and not the machine's fault. Um, the difference with this, so this photo that's here now, there's, uh, you'll, when you're down there next, you'll see that there's now a little light right here that's been installed that flashes when the machine is on. So if you're vacuuming and somebody has left the machine on, you don't take a giant chunk out of the vacuum hose, thankfully not your hand, um, which is perhaps a little, you know what, I'm going to take that as a tangent and take a moment to talk about wood shop safety. I don't think we have a joint or a, um, a slide in here specifically for that, but I think it's probably worth talking about a little bit um, that like the wood shop, you're not in danger in the wood shop. Nothing's going to like jump up and punch you. Like it's not like there's, there's no inherent risk in just like being in the wood shop. And this goes for the metal shop as well. Um, but these machines are powerful in a lot of ways. Um, and so you, I think it's, it's, it's worth saying that like going slow when you're working on a project, don't, don't try to rush through to like finish this thing before you have to go immediately. Um, which is how somebody had left the jointer on actually they were just kind of rushing through their project and hadn't been thinking about it. Um, and there's, I don't know, Jared, you, you please chime in, but like, there's just, there's, 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 there's not an inherent, there's no inherent danger in being in the wood shop, but it does require some caution. Caution and yeah. respect. It's not, nothing to be feared. It's just to have respect for the tools um, and just be cognizant of what you're doing. Always, always just be aware of what's going on. Um, I've had so many industrial safety classes while I all this talk. <laughs> I just like do your best to like be present, be present in the project that you're working on. Not, you know, it's why we don't allow any drinking in either of the shops. Same, same idea. Right. So yeah. One thing I always say is always think. I hesitate to say this because I don't want you to like have any fear, but <laughs> always think of what could go wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. So you you walk up to a machine, and I, I do this uh, to a machine that I've used a million times. What could go wrong if, if my hand slips, if someone bumps into me, if you know, all the think of all these things that could go wrong, and then think of what you're going to do to keep that from happening. And sometimes there's nothing you can do, you know, uh, uh, risk hazard analysis. You try to uh, compromise between the risks and the hazard. Well, one hazard doesn't mean you're falling through the, the roof. I mean, yeah, <laughs> that can't happen. What are you going to do about it? No, no, like no. The, the chance of happening is so much. <laughs> but uh, that's you know, the experience. But um, yeah, so it's, it's just a way you're not going to catch every possible hazard with every tool, but just to kind of keep in your mind and and um, not be complacent about it. That's that's the case. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. All right. So the jointer, it's enormous, and it's I and think this is a very nice jointer. Like this, is it? It's a big, heavy jointer. It's. it's I'm like certain this is show. in here. That jointer. Jointer is in this building until the end of time. Yeah. There's no, I can't even fathom how they got it in here. I don't know if anybody's like seen it in the wood shop, but it's, I mean, that's a full size garbage can it's next to. Like it's enormous. Um, but yeah, the way that so the way that so so the jointer to backtrack from my own tangent. So the jointer is the first tool or the first machine that you'll use when you're squaring a board. Um, and so I wish we had like a pointer. We should get like one of those like big oh, yeah. extendy pointers so I can just like touch the screen from here. Um, and so the way that it works is under that yellow, well, those yellow things are actually little handles to help you move the, the board across so your hands are farther away. But under that yellow handle um, is a piece of wood and that piece of wood is sitting on top of the, the sharp parts. Um, and the way that it works, it's, I'm not good at drawing. You draw, I'll point. Um, so this bed 
It's actually two beds. And then right in the middle is the spinny beds. And this bed is just a little bit higher than this bed. And you adjust that to determine how much you want to take off of your board. So if this, if this is my board, I'm going to put it on this bed and I'm going, I'm sorry, it's the other way around. No, I got it, yeah. Um, so I'm going to run this process board over the teeth to take out everything that is under this level. Does that make sense? Yeah, so this this cutter is this way. It is tangent. So the top of the cutter is perfectly even with this table. Right? Just different. So this this side of the table moves up and down. You can adjust it. And we adjust it to like, like, you know, 30 seconds and it's real, real, real tight. So when you take a piece of wood and you pass it through here, it'll cut. And as soon as it's done cutting, now it, that piece of wood is perfectly level with this side of the table. So it's a way to remove just a little bit of the bottom edge of that wood. So if you're your wood, looks like this. <laughs> As it moves, a brown yeah, <laughs> it's going to cut the difference between this table and this table. If, if that distance is this much, now as it cuts across, it's going to cut off all that. I'm exaggerating the weightiness, but if it's cupped, if it's you know warped. Um, so you're going to end up with one smooth one, side. One flat surface. Flatness, flatness is our goal. Flatness is the goal. Yes. What's the difference between that and a planer? Good question. We'll get to that. Yeah. 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 Next up. Uh, next up. <laughs> um, and then you can also do, you can see at the bottom of this slide, it says edge, edge jointing as well. After you get a flat, you get your big, you can know. Right. Hey, I should have brought a piece up. Go for it. So is this like basically like a deli slicer, but just for wood? <laughs> you got it, bud. <laughs> and this is like in my sorry, in my mind, this takes you from a rough piece and gives you your very first flat that everything else can be referenced from. Right. So you do this before the planer because it gives you one flat surface to work from, and then you can go from there. Yeah. So that flat surface is now our reference. That is going to be the first thing that we work off. Everything will be squared else. off of that. Yeah. So like actually, was saying that that back fence on the back of the joiner is theoretically a perfect ninety degrees. So if I take this now flat surface and I flip it up ninety degrees and, and I press it. it against that back fence and then run it through again, now I have one perfect. 90 degree piece of wood that's looks like this. <laughs> so it's a great get otherwise. Yeah. All right. So that's the jointer. That's the first one. So after that, then we go to the planer. And so the way, do you want to explain how the planer works? Yeah. So now we have a piece of wood that has one perfect 90 degree angle. The planer is kind of like a joiner upside down, but it is completely flat. So instead of the, the cutter on the bottom and put the wood over, over the top of it, now the cutter is above. And pretend that's really sharp. <laughs> Um, and there are a couple feed rollers, so like a rubber roller. Um, this one actually goes down here. And then there's a table on the bottom. And that table is adjustable. So there's a little wheel on the side of the planer that adjusts this table up and down in a very precise, fine increment. So we can take our piece of wood. Remember, now we have our reference surface here that's nice and perfectly flat. We put it through the planer, a piece of wood 
catches that roller, the roller will push it through the cutter. And now our top and bottom surface are parallel. So now we've got three surfaces that are, if this is 90 degrees to this, and this bottom is parallel with the top, then we know that the, this surface is now 90 degrees to this. Yeah, so if we didn't do the joiner first, let's say we took a piece of wood that had, it looked like our, our weird poop. Yeah, our weird poop. And, and we sent that through. The, as this roller pushes down on the wood going through, if there's any unevenness in the bottom, it will follow that unevenness as it goes through the cutter. So the planer is really good at transferring whatever is on the bottom to the top. So if we don't do the joiner first and we send it through, it's going to basically transfer whatever to the top. Um, there's some ways around that. If you have like a really big piece of wood that won't fit through the joiner, um, you can use like a sled. So it's like a sled. Um, take your piece of wood and you bolt it down somehow. It's a, that's a little tricky, but um, you can bolt it down or screw it down and it doesn't matter what the bottom surface is as long as the sled is nice and flat and the sled goes through mm -hmm. and it holds the wood up and cuts it nice and flat. It's another trick if you don't have a joint. So luckily we did. We have a great joint. So every time. Yeah. So, there's, uh, there's also a good trick. If you buy your wood at Home Depot, it's S4S and you don't have to do either of these two processes. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> also, yeah, you could just buy wood that is already <laughs> Yeah, that's Home Depot and Lowe's, yep. Yeah. That's for it. Uh, no. Oh, good. Oh, no. yeah. <laughs> oh, man, I fucked the whole thing up. Uh, Can you say fuck on YouTube? <laughs> oh. So the last part, uh, probably the next slide. If we had a slide. Guys. Oh, man. <laughs> so fast. So fast. Um, it went bad so quickly. I would just use the table saw. So the, the table saw has a nice flat table. Um, it has a fence that is 90 degrees and then the blade. Nothing happens. As long as the blade angle is set correctly at 90 degrees, it'll make that final. Uh, so we're, we're, we made our first reference on the joiner. And then technically we're doing a lot of assumptions after that. We're assuming that this is the table is 90 degrees to this fence. And we're assuming that this table is you know parallel with the cutter and stuff like that. But essentially we're making a flat surface, we're making it parallel, we're making this perpendicular, and then we make that perpendicular, and we end up with side four something square four sides, I think it is. Is that right? Square four sides? Yeah. yeah. Square four sides. Yeah, all right. Nope. <laughs> um I don't know what. What snipe is? Snipe, yeah. So okay. if you, <laughs> it's a word I don't have in my brain. If we take our piece of not good wood that we haven't joined it yet, and this happens even if we do join it, um, this first roller pushes down, it pushes it puts a lot of pressure on the wood down. So what happens is when the wood first comes in, the the cutter will um, this one. As you push down on it to get rid of snipe. Yeah, so the, the wood comes in kind of at an angle when it cuts. And then when the, the outfeed roller catches it, it, then it makes it square. So what snipe is, you'll see snipe is the first little bit of the wood that you put through the pointer has a kind of a cut edge to it. Um, the ways to get rid of snipe is usually to make sure that your bottom is nice and flat. That way it resists the, the tendency to rock as it goes in. Um, the other way is to kind of push down on the, on the back end a little bit. And keep it physically with your... Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. That's my understanding. That's a 
No, that makes sense. I now the yeah. layman's understanding of stipend. Yeah. Um, oh, so you could also yeah. So then we can move on to the table saw and use. I feel like everybody can figure this one out. So this we cut on the jointer, and we just use that as the reference on the. Is this this is a sled? Yes. Fence. Thank you. See, I know it's all in here, but you know. Um, sorry, Corey, I'm not trying to just make you. <laughs> You're all off. good. You're doing all right. <laughs> um, so you use this edge up against this, and then the table saw gives you your last piece. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. yes. I don't ask if it makes sense because I don't think you can figure it out. It's because I don't know if I'm explaining it well, but mm -hmm. just so everybody, <laughs> everybody knows. Um, and the table saw is, yeah, one of the most useful. Yep. And yeah, I guess it is. Do you think, do you feel, like, do you agree that it's one of the most dangerous tools in the wood shop? Mm. Definitely not that one. It's a saw stop. Yeah, it's yeah, a saw stop. Yeah, maybe my, maybe my experience is just. I'll put a link in foundations chat. Yeah. It's very safe. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very safe. yeah. Um, yeah. No, saw stop is cool. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's what we do. You put the big sausage or whatever, and it stops the neglect. Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So the way that the way that the this specific, we have two of them, um, but the way that saw stops specifically work, which is what we have, um, is that there's, and I'm going to explain it very simply. I'm sure there's a lot of clearly a lot of technology that goes into it, but the blade is connected to an electrical current. And the minute it touches anything that conducts electricity, flesh, moisture, anything like that, it stops itself. There's, and if you go into the wood shop and you look over on the left side wall, um, we've made a few clocks out of them. There's this piece, yeah, Jared, just Jared, there's this piece that's on an exceptionally strong spring it's that- like, It's like a brick. Yeah, that just, jams itself into the blade it ruins the blade but it will stop you will just get a paper cut okay. rather than losing your finger it's like it's really you, you could watch you, you could you know go on youtube and you know and check it out but it's like it's yeah and part of kind of the other side of that is that not only will it go off if your hand touches it it'll also go off if a hot dog touches it um <laughs> Or but, to wet wood, or to or, wet wood. or a piece metal of metal. Somebody so, put metal through it once. Yeah, if there's a staple in your piece of wood that you put on the table saw, your chance of setting off the saw stop is real. Um, and like we don't want to do that if only because it's expensive. Just yeah. I don't want to replace the module. Once you see the video, I think we were saying like eight. Two hundred bucks. Yeah, two hundred bucks. This model was like two or two fifty or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I hate to admit this, but I, <laughs> I'm so excited. Yeah, I tend to think about safety on the the table saw more about saving that 250 bucks than my fingers. Oh yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Still, that works, right? Yeah, yeah. it works. Because I'm thinking about, oh man, I don't want to almost spend 200 bucks. No, because <laughs> no. you know that, like, if I do touch it, I know that the saw stop's going to stop me. I mean, I, nobody wants a paper cut, but like, right. it's going to stop a, a, a legit injury. Yeah. Um, and it's a really it's a cool tool it's i've definitely yeah. and there is an awful lot you can do with with any table saw um, i think on the next slide you'll you can see there's, there's all these different jigs and stuff you can you can fumble your way through just about anything using only a table saw like maybe yeah. not the most efficient way maybe yeah. not the easiest way yeah but all the other little things you can do like you can use sleds and you can make your you know, uh, S4S wood on table saw. Technically, yeah. Technically. Yeah, yeah. Easy, but, yeah. Uh, if somebody said, like, you can only have one wood shop machine for the rest of your life, a table saw is what you're, yeah, yep. what I would take. And yeah, so we, you know, we've talked about table sleds, table saw sleds a little bit um, in a couple different ways, but these are some more common ways that people, you know, will use. A, a sled is just a form that allows you to make the cuts that you want. Um, and I feel like the, like the box joint, the one in the, the bottom middle is a really great example of that. I'm making a box joint. I want them, I want those, I'm going to make two pieces. I want them to slip together perfectly. 
and I need them to be the same distance each time because I'm making teeth effectively. Um, and so I make a sled that lets me run those pieces through the same distance every single time. So that's kind of the, and there's, yeah, there's, we've got a ton of sleds that are just pre-built, you know, that members have made because they needed them and they just leave them. They all live under the table, uh, the table saw. You can also make your own. You'll see people comment in the, the Slack channel occasionally. I was like, oh, I made this thing. I left it under you for anybody who wants to use it. Yeah, um, like even this one on the bottom. It looks like it, it looks like a custom jig to put a particular angle on that that cut. So he figured out his angle, screwed the wood down to, to fit it, and that little hole, I call it a jig, but that whole setup is just to cut that angle on that piece of wood. Yeah, and to do it exactly. Exactly, so. and repeatably. So if you needed 50 of those, I don't know, that's a heck of a lot easier than trying to try to measure 50 of them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and they can also help with safety. You know, if I've got my hands, you know, any of those, you know, their hands are way farther away from the blade than if you were just holding it yourself. It's not the primary use of them, but just a little added bonus. Oh man, pants off. All right, so we scared, squared our wood. We're good to go. Let's make some weird things. Bandsaws, I love that. I was initially fairly intimidated by bandsaws. I think because they're loud, it doesn't take much. Um, but you can make some really cool stuff with a bandsaw. A bandsaw is effectively, I don't know if the next slide talks about it. No, okay. So a bandsaw, what's happening here is that there is a flexible blade. You can see them back here on the, on the wall waiting. It's just a very thin circular blade that is attached to a pulley down here and a pulley up here. And when you turn it on, it just does this. Mm -hmm. And so you will man, you know, with, with your hands or whatever you want, um, you just guide your wood through in whatever shape you're looking for. And those, the three images on the bottom, those are really fun examples of things you can make a bandsaw box which is what that first actually both the first and the second one are um those were made entirely on the bandsaw those were fully cut out i, I mean they were sanded otherwise and, and finished and whatnot um but, but they came out of one piece of wood and if you kind of look care especially at this bottom one if you look you can kind of uh, you can see how it all follows just one cut you know, it's not, there's no glue back to, together. There's no, it's, it's kept. This one is almost certainly, there's, pro, there's, there's almost certainly a cut in here that was glued back together that we can't see because they had to cut out this middle. You can't cut a hole with a bandsaw but by itself without, you have to make an entry point. So there are some limitations to it, but it is, it's a great tool for if you want to manipulate something yourself, if you've got a more intricate, you know, a table saw is very powerful. You're going to be able to cut through all sorts of stuff. You can make an endless number of jigs to, or sled, jig sleds, whatever, um, to make different angles and shapes. But a bandsaw is going to let you do almost more artsy stuff, Yeah, definitely. you know? Um, and it's super easy to use. It is loud, but... Let me tell you that it's not actually intimidating once you once you've gotten into it. Um, and it does have, you know, there are some restrictions. The blade can only can't really move. So doing angles, you have to kind of plan for accordingly. Um, but there's a lot of really elegant shapes you can make with a bandsaw. That's it's much more tactile. Like the, the table saw is very precise. You know, you got a fence and table and everything's kind of lined up and but this, the, the band saws, and you're always doing it by hand and you're moving it. And it's, it's, it's fun. Yeah. 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 How complicated is that bottom piece on the left? Not. Not um, terrible. It's, yeah. it's a good bandsaw boxes are a good beginner project. And I would say if you only are going to get one badge this week, like if you only want to touch one tool in the wood shop because the whole thing terrifies you, the bandsaw could be a good candidate because. It is often pretty beginner friendly. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. The first time, the first time I actually used it, I had a very real like, oh, 
It's fine. Yeah. This is fine. Yeah. So absolutely. And we have two of them. The our chat boxes are kind of blocking the other one, but um, one has a wider, one is taller, so you can fit taller pieces in, and another is wider, so you can fit wider pieces in, but they function exactly the same. Chop saw. Yeah, so we haven't even mentioned cross cutting yet. So when we look at our picture, our picture of wood grain, um, we go along the grain, that's called ripping. Um, so like a table saw is really good for ripping. If you have a nice long board and you're, you're cutting it this way, you're cutting through those straws, that's ripping. If you're cutting across the straws, then you're cross cutting. Um, and if you take, they have a big beam or something like that, you're ripping it this way. Yeah. If you take it and put it on its side like that, that's free sawing. That's the previous slide with the, with the band saws. Um, Resawing not done a whole lot, but um, oh, it can be done. Draws like a great piece of wood. Oh, beautiful. Uh, <laughs> Resawing's dicey, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, ripping is along the grain, top to bottom, and cross cut is cross across. However, do they come up with these names? Yeah. <laughs> um, so the compound miter saw it's. I think it's, it's a great the, tool for cutting things to length. It's the machine. I, it's the tool I use the most for five seconds. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's. I was. I was making a. I'm making a, a box for a, a um, mold that I'm making, and I just had to cut all the pieces for it. And I was just in and out of the wood shop yesterday. I think 17 times, just cutting one little piece over and over again, and that's. I'm sure the chop saw has more uses than that, but that is what I find I use it for is just just the the little stuff. The yeah, I need a four yeah. inch piece of this piece of wood. I'm gonna cut it on the chop saw. Yeah. I bought one for at home to do trim in a house, mm -hmm. ground molding, baseboards, chair rails, the whole bit. It's really good for that. Yeah. yeah. It's like what it's for. Yeah, that right. the black little lever right here, you can push it down and you can rotate this piece so if you if you are made if you're doing trim on a window and you need a 45 degree angle to for the corners this is the thing mm -hmm. that will do it for you you could use a miter box let me tell you oh, you don't want to use a miter box mm -hmm. they suck mm -hmm. they're terrible you could use a table saw but yeah but this setup, is just it's, easier it'll take it'll take you longer to set up the table saw than it would be to cut five times on that. Absolutely, absolutely. And every time I go in my bathroom, I look at that window and that trim, and I am mad that I did that project before I joined my kato. <laughs> <laughs> every time. <laughs> so, yeah, the chop saw is like, and also like, I feel like the chop saw is one of the first machines that people use because mm -hmm. it's just, it's just easy to use. It's very it's direct yeah. keep your hand out of the yellow part and you're fine that's honestly um, other stationary tools you're going to talk about a scroll saw i've never used it before i know what it does but i'm just <laughs> so a scroll saw is, is almost like a band saw it's got a really thin narrow blade but it instead of revolving around two wheels it just goes up and down so it only cuts in one direction, but um, the blade is, is so narrow that it's really good at making fine detailed cuts. So if you have like um, a jigsaw, that's or jigsaw puzzle kind of thing. Like if you were making cut of a puzzle, a uh, scroll saw would be great for that. Uh, Where did the hmm? jigsaw come from? I don't know, chicken or the egg, I don't know. I'm gonna guess that the puzzle came second. Oh yeah. 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 Probably jig. Maybe it's something like jigsaw. Or... <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I'm gonna Google that later. Don't worry. Uh <laughs> panel saw. Real so we yes, we can go back. There. So like Ashley was saying with the bandsaw, there's no way to cut a hole in the bandsaw. You can do inside holes with the jigsaw or the scroll saw because the blade comes out. So if you if you have a piece of wood, drill a hole through it. 
and then you put it in there, you can put the blade in and then reconnect it. And now you can do cuts on the inside. And then when you're done, you just disconnect the blade and take it out. There you go. All right. <clears throat> All right. Panel saw, a specialty saw. Yeah. So this is if you have to cut down a four by eight or like a big pan, like a big panel of wood, this is the machine that you want to use. Um, it sits up again. The blade is right here and it goes up and down. So you slide the sheet in to wherever it is you want to cut. You go down, you go up. It does one thing very well. That's <laughs> yeah, if you have a sheet of wood the size of one of these tables, getting it into the, the table saw yeah. is going to be a pain in the butt. Yeah. If I only need, you know, a little bit off of it, put it in the, in the panel saw. Yeah. Drill press, great for making holes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There you go. We did it. Yeah. That's um, yeah. I get wood needs to be clamped down because so the way that it works is you put your wood here. This gets turned by these little three handle things, and you just put the drill. It's like a stationary drill. Yeah, really. Um, and people ask like, why would you use a drill press instead of just a hand drill? Uh, a drill press. You've got that table and. And it's relatively well aligned to the spindle, so it, it's a perfect ninety degrees. So if you have a hand drill, you're you're going to be off a little bit. Your hole might be a little crooked. If you have two pieces that you're trying to join with a with a dowel in between, you drill a hole in one and drill a hole in the other with a with a handsaw. I can almost guarantee you those pieces are not going to be flat when you stick them together. They're going to be off a little bit. Um, so a, a drill press makes a nice evenly perpendicular hole yeah. for your drill. And there's a hole in that that little kind of gray box on the table. There's a hole in that. So you're not like you're not gonna drill. put a hole in a yeah. table by using a table, you know, a drill. <laughs> I don't know. Um yeah, be careful to lock the table before and before you use and unlock it afterwards. The table you can rotate it or you can at least angle it a bit. So there's a whole bunch of like adjustments. So you can get really like repeatable, precise cuts. You can tell it to stop at this depth. There's a whole lot of stuff, but mostly just drill straight holes. <laughs> you have to adjust the belts up top like you do the metal drill press. This one, no, this one has a handle that you turn to change the speed. That's pretty nice. I've also never changed it. I've used this, I've used the yeah. drill press a bunch and I, I've never had a need to mess with the, the settings on it. All right. Certainly can, and I'm not. I'm not a professional woodworker. I'm a make haven woodworker. It's, you know, um, if you're drilling a four inch hole, change the speed. Otherwise, don't. Yes. All right, that's yeah. fair. Oh, four inches. The hole saw. It's a big hole. Yeah. All right. This tool is different from the rest. So that is correct. Wood lathe lathes are cool. Um, so, I mean. I was gonna, I was gonna see if you, and then I remember that you're not bad on it. But this is jazz. Okay, let me talk. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Th this is this is jazz woodworking. The lathe has mm -hmm. some serious safety issues. If we were to put like in order of more and less safe, the lathe is one you have to be very conscious of. We have all the right gear, so you can do it safely, but you don't have to do any math in advance. Like it's jazz woodworking. You make it up as you go. You make like a a good starter is like a Harry Potter wand where it's radially symmetric and it looks however weird way you want it to come out. And it it's, you need very little math in advance. So some people find that really appealing. Um, Paul, if he's still a facilitator, loves no. the lathe and he'll almost like, if you get to see Paul use it, he's almost like dancing as he uses it. It's really wild how different it is from everything else. Yeah. Jazz woodworking is, a, is an excellent way to, mm. to say that. So you pin your pieces, or you pin, you pin your piece in between these two spots. This is for resting the tool on. So you use a long metal piece that has a sharp bit right at the end, and you're just carving. It's how you make 
wands and candlesticks, bowls, anything like that. You can also, there are ways to, and th these are very common, um, to just attach it on one side so that you can make a bowl, so you can like carve out the whole middle, um, mugs, cups, bowls, plates, you know, anything you want, anything like that, that you want to make out of wood, the, the wood lathe is, is, is made for that. Um, it is also hands down the messiest tool in the wood shop, and that alone is a reason to learn how to use it, because, <laughs> man, just, I mean, a blast radius. I think we have a vacuum attached to it, but it's, I feel like it's free to go. It's, yeah. <laughs> like, it's, yeah, and it's, you have a lot of fun you'll, when you're done, you're just wasting it. Uh, yeah yeah you can always tell when somebody walks out of the wood shop when they've been on the lane because it's just, <laughs> yeah they're just covered uh, yeah and this tool is different from the rest uh, one of the reasons every other tool the the tool moves and the wood gets put through the tool this the wood moves you're putting the tool through the wood the difference between the way and, and that is yeah and that is the same for all lathes whatever shop you happen to be in Powder table. All right. This is, I'm not going to go into all of these things because there's a lot, as you can see. No, <laughs> correct. Do not do that. Yeah. Um, so, a, a, do you want to, you might be able to explain it better than I can. Yeah. This, this is one of my favorite tools because it, it is so, so versatile. Um, you've got little bits and you can see the, the, all the, the different bits that are, that are available. <laughs> Well, let's we'll backtrack because this is a router table. There is a router. A router is basically you took a motor, electric motor, and you stuck a sharp bit on it. That's a router. Hmm. You can put some handles on it, put some safety gear on it, put a little flat, flat perpendicular edge on it, and you make it nice, but that's basically what a router is. So these little bits spin really, really fast. And if you put a nice shape to it and you run it along the edge of a piece of wood, that gives you nice edges. So something like this, this wasn't rounded, but you get the idea. If you pretend this is wood. If you have a, a, a bit that's the opposite shape of this, and you run it along the piece of wood, it gives you that nice shape. Um, you can do dovetails. <clears throat> if you take a piece of wood and you run this dovetail cutter through it this way, now it gives you that perfect little dovetail shape that you'd have to sit there for half an hour with a saw and cut it out and it'd be a little wonky. And, um, <laughs> Yeah, so this, all these little bits you put in right. right in this little piece. And then, you know, if you're doing an edge, you would, you know, you put it up against the fence. fence thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and if you take that motor, run it across, flip it upside down, and mount it to yeah. the underside of that table. There. Now you got to run it. Yeah, so you run your piece across. And as it says, only move to the left. That's how it spins. Um, and then if you're doing one of, you know, something where you are making a piece in the middle, you just run your piece over it instead of against it. Yeah, you can put a slot down the middle of a table, a square slot. You can put a, a dovetail slot down the middle of a piece of wood. Um, you can do edge things. You can transfer a pattern to a piece of wood. Um, if you had, I think we had a guy who was making a guitar oh. and he had a very, I think he used like a laser cutter to cut a template for the neck of the guitar. So you look at a guitar and the neck kind of tapers down a little bit towards it where it gets to the end. So you cut out a template and if you glue that template to a piece of wood and then you see some of these bits have a little bearing. The bearing doesn't cut obviously, but if you put the template up against the bearing and you space it just right, the, the bearing will follow the template and just above it, the cutter will cut the wood. So you can transfer templates really, really precisely to a piece of wood. That's one of my favorite uses of a router table. I've used the router table a lot, and I didn't know that was an option. That's awesome. yeah. And then if you if you you can even this is a little full in depth, but like the bearing here is a little smaller than the the cutter. So if you if they have kits where they have all different size bearings and all different size cutters, and however you mount them together, you can take a template and you can cut something bigger than the template or smaller than the template. So it's an easy way to take something and make it bigger. So something really complicated. It doesn't have to be a straight template. It could be curvy with all kinds of weird curves in it and will transfer that template to the wood perfectly. That's very cool. The router, if I could 
only pick two tools from the wood shop, it would be table saw first and router table second for me um, because it's they're both so versatile. The one other thing that while I'm chiming in from home, I would say is that if I were to make a list of most dangerous and it can be used safely, this is probably the top of the most dangerous list because it, the cutting bit is just there and you need to be careful of it. And the big arrow of only moved to the left. If you go the other way, it'll kick your, it'll rip the piece out of your hand or kick it in ways you don't expect. So it can be handled safely and that's different from an element of danger, but it's another one that you gotta be conscious of. Yeah. And that bit was going really fast. Mm -hmm. And if you forget and move to the right, you're not, I mean, you're probably not going to die, but yeah. you will be immediately aware of, oh, no, wrong. Yeah, and then it'll chew up your piece of weight. Yeah, quickly. I'm not going to say I've done it. But... <laughs> we all learn at different speeds. <laughs> the router is just a high speed. Uh, all right. And there are, there are at least, there are a few more tools in the wood shop, and we'll, like, talk about some of the other the ones kind of later on, because they're, like, more, like, level two sort of things, but... There are a lot of hand tools that we have here, and you probably have at home. Um, do you want to talk about some of some of them? Yeah, um, you know, rip cut dovetail saw. That's you know, like I said, ripping and cross cutting. Same thing with hand saws. It's just the, the tooth geometry is a little different. Um, dovetail it usually it's finer teeth. So you can really get in there. So 14 PPI, that's teeth per inch. Um, usually the closer, the, the more teeth there are per inch, the finer the cut is. Um, and like the two band saws, one has a fine, real fine uh, tooth blade, the other has a little more coarse. Um, same thing with hand saws. Bench planes, um, before they made joiners and planers, they used hand planes. You take a piece of, one like this, and these old timers go there and look at it, and they look at it, and they take this hand plane. And hand plane is basically just a, a really big, fat razor blade on an angle, mm -hmm. and they just shave off a little bits. They look at it, and they, and they go there and shave off more, and soon it, it's just as flat as if they put it through a machine. Yeah. Um, There's all sorts of, you know, yeah, all different types of planes for all different reasons. Yeah. And we have. Let's see. Let's see what these links are. I didn't actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just your saws, your hammers, all that stuff. Um, we also have in the cabinet, talking about planers. These are like the, the good stuff. Yeah. The really fancy. These are just like right in here are just, yeah, giant razor, super sharp razor blades. Um, and these are chisels mm -hmm. so these this part is super super sharp um and actually to get the badge for the woodworking tools you can almost yeah you can see right there the prerequisite is the knife sharpening so you have to know how to sharpen those tools before you can use the, the fine wood yeah and these are very like i said these are the good stuffs and they're very precise they're very smooth they're like don't drop any of these on the table because you'll dent them also don't use them in a rush because these will cut through your skin so easily you won't notice mm -hmm. until you're like why is there blood on my mom's picture frame <laughs> oh it's mine uh <laughs> Hey, oh, no, learn from me. Uh, <laughs> no project is complete. A little blood sweater here. Yeah, that's accurate. Yeah, that is very accurate. Um, oh. All right. I need some tape. That's, I think, the problem here. Aren't we a makerspace? Shouldn't I have tape up here somewhere? Yeah, right. Where do we find gloves? Like, like your two workbooks? Yeah, like workbooks. Um, there are some throughout the space, various spaces. There's like there's maybe more in the metal shop than the wood shop. Yeah, which you're welcome to grab. Yeah, you're welcome, welcome to, to grab. go into the wood shop um, or the metal shop and take whatever it is that you want. Um, yeah, we just want to pass it, put it back where you found it. There's 
stuff migrates. Do we? Have, no, don't we have? Because all the all the ear protection is on the wall. Yep. And then one side is like hair ties and stuff. Isn't it gloves on the other side? There are a bunch in the space. Yeah. I think there are some. Yeah. It's one of those things that I think I've walked by so many times I don't see it anymore. Yeah. So I can't I can't picture if I'm if I'm making it up or not. But yeah, gloves we'll gloves are sometimes a safety problem mm -hmm. because if your if your finger touches the side of a bandsaw blade, it's not a good day, but you'll feel it immediately. If a glove touches the side of a bandsaw blade, the glove can start to get sucked in for you know what's going on and you have a much worse day. Um, maybe you remember Jimmy Fallon had his finger wrapped for a long time. I don't want to explain what that injury is, but he got degloved. And so it was a, yeah, so probably best to not wear gloves for safety in either the wood shop or the metal shop. Yeah, it's mostly rotating machinery. I think if you use yeah. the you're probably okay with handles. Yeah. 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 Oh, uh, Degloving, you can just kind of imagine. All right. Pneumatic tools. So this uh, air powered tools, nailers, staplers. Um, I'm sure this isn't always the case, but in my experience, pneumatic tools are usually for putting something into something. Mm -hmm. They're not, I don't see a lot, I don't see a lot of like, shop, yeah, yeah, metal like, shop, it's more cutting and grinding. Yeah, but yeah, it's the hose, I think there's a couple of them, they yep. hang from the ceiling, you attach them with these brass, the brass, whatever, the oh, metal pieces say, over there, yeah. These, um, these little uh, sleeves pull down, and then you take that and stick it in there, and let go of the sleeve, and it locks in place. Yeah, you see... I feel like you see nailer pneumatic nailers a lot in like home construction for just high speed nail yeah all different sizes that's a pretty big one and yeah. that goes all the way down to little brad nailers so if you're putting together a doll house or you know a jewelry box or something like that real thin kind of wood they make little tiny nails and staples um you just yeah yeah so faster easier but not exceptionally different than a staple gun or you know anything that that's equivalent um and i think there's a there's one badge for all the pneumatic tools um, good all right uh then we have electric pan tools i'm not going to go through all of these a, a bunch of these are going to be familiar i imagine to people sanders and hand saws and hand drills and all that sort of stuff okay, I got one. It's a so it's like it's a it's a flour and butter. <laughs> um, a biscuit uh, is like a. It looks like this shape. They help align pieces of wood when you're gluing them together, um, and it's got a real niche use, um, but it does it really well. Sometimes they have like little pad, like a pattern for glue, so if you. Let's say you have two pieces of wood that are going together on the edge. Not a real great way to glue something because it's not real strong. So what you do is you cut a recess into the side of the wood on both sides. And that recess, one side would be that, and the other side would be that. And then you put glue on the biscuit and then uh, yep, yes, perfect. Cut one side, cut the other, put glue on the biscuit, stick it in. That one's hard to describe, I feel yeah. like. <laughs> they make all different sizes. Oh, sorry. No, it's not. Oh, okay. I, guess I still got it open. It does look fun. It is. It's, 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 a, it's a very good tool. Yeah. That third picture is really good. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. That. The biscuit lines up the two pieces, keeps them from sliding. It's a little extra strength. And they swell, too. They swell a little bit. So yeah. As well, they, they make the joint stronger. It's the next step above the IKEA dollars. <laughs> the same idea. All right. 
Look at this way fancier projects idea slide. I love this. This is, look at that. That cutting board is cool. Um, all right, yeah. So we had a taste of this earlier when we looked <laughs> at the other slide. Um, lots of, there's, I mean, so many good options to just get into the wood shop and, and give it a shot. Um, you know, we've got, these are all, these three are bandsaw boxes. These are, this, in fact, we have a book. I have to find it if anybody wants to look at it, but I'm happy to find it, um, of just plans for like a bunch of different bandsaw boxes and different shapes and whatnot. Um, these were done on the lathe, these salt and pepper shakers, I imagine. At least that's what they look like to me, right? Um, you could make just a box with whatever and join stuff together however you want. This is the sort of thing you could absolutely do in an afternoon with just a few machines. These were also done on the lathe. Is this an urn? I don't know. The internet gave me that photo. I know, but it, <laughs> I mean, urns are nice that people use them. I'm not, I just. Yeah, like, you probably like, could. It's really pretty wood. Is it a burl, you think? It looks yeah. like, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, you could do a cutting board. There's whatever makes you happy. Whatever, honestly, if any of these machines or tools, you're like, hmm, that looks like fun. Then like there's a there's a project for that. Um people have had really cool ones in the past. One that happened last year that I really liked was a dog bowl holder that was a skateboard deck, um, which is just cut two big holes. It worked really well. Um, put like feet on it so it's above the ground so yeah yep uh that's top center bandsaw box the one that's just simple looking that's a good starter um box box like the little treasure box up there everything and a lot of things in furniture building are based around boxes and so learning how to build a better box is always useful if you if you're headed that way um and cutting boards are always delightful and they make really great gifts and if you can find two friends to go, each of you go to Home Depot or Lowe's and buy a different color of wood, and then you just chop it up and share, then you can have a nice three color cutting board and it, and it works really well. Yeah, yeah. And that's maybe, uh, uh, don't feel hesitant to go to Home Depot or Lowe's or any of the like, there's a couple dedicated wood <laughs> warehouses in the area. Um, to like just go in and poke around and see what's there. Um, if any, there's what there's uh, the wood rack in Brantford. There's what's the other one in Brantford? Brings End. End in Brantford. But I went there recently and they weren't as helpful as I wanted them to be. But I, I would say going to a sawmill is trickier than you think it will be. Um, because they expect you to show up knowing exactly what you want, which is probably awesome if you are that person, but most of us aren't. And so at least I, it's taken me a long time to wrap my head around what I might want there. Going into the, it's the select lumber is what they call it. I think at Home Depot and Lowe's where it's just like extra straight. You can buy like a strip of nice straight oak or, um, poplar or sometimes they'll trick you into buying walnut there there's like a range of cherry they probably have but those boards are fairly thin um you know they're they're things that the wood rack or rings end wouldn't stock but they're still very good and they make great cutting boards and they're already square so you don't have to fight that battle before you even get to the project of scoring up the piece of wood so i 10 out of 10 would recommend go to one of the big box stores and buy a piece of lumber and go with that. It doesn't, you, if you don't buy much, it's not very expensive. You can walk out with less than $25 worth of wood and still make something that's, you know, fun and memorable. Um, and just uh, from my experience, the Home Depot in North Haven is way better than the one in Hamden. Just their selection is just way, way better in North Haven. So. So there's scrap also available. Yep, yep. There's also definitely scrap. I just want the tree that have fallen down in years past. So can I just bring that in and someone can assess it? Like, would someone be like, "No, don't use this. It's 
No, what, what? I don't know the what. I don't know the tree. Yeah. So you lived in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure if you brought it in and asked any of the the woodshop facilitators or any of the you know uh, anybody who's in the woodshop all the time would yeah. be happy to 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 give give their thoughts and you know you want drier wood for most things. Um, yeah, you could absolutely. Can we have a dryer for the wood if it's small enough? I don't think we have anything that dries wood. You'd use some sort of a kiln, but yeah. both of yeah. ours, people who do kilns for pottery, only want pottery in there, and the metal shop kiln is not really for that. So, but the scrap pile in the back of Makehaven storage area is a gold mine, and you should go check it every time you come in, because every so often there's magical things that you find there that are totally worth just keeping. I have definitely goblins my way out of yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, because people, yeah, Corey is not wrong. But people leave some really awesome stuff there because they just don't need it anymore. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, take, you know, we'll be in the wood shop for two weeks. So don't feel like you have to go and do a thing tomorrow. Um, I will expect to be here, be in maybe on Sunday. Um, I don't know. I'll send a, I'm, you know, I'll put a message up on the Slack panel and see like what time seemed to work best for everybody. And we'll just kind of loosely establish, you know, a couple default office hours for like going forward because everybody's schedule's different. Um, but, you know, take, uh, again, I'll put these slides up on, on Slack. Take the weekend, think about what you want. If you have ideas, put them up in the Slack, message me, message Jared, message Corey. And if he's not, Corey's not getting barked on, I'm sure he'll answer you as soon as he can, um, <laughs> you know, and like, feel for, I'm happy to to toss ideas around. Um, and even if I don't, I am not, I am an expert in nothing and passively decent in a lot of stuff that's at Make Haven. And if I can't answer, I will pass you on to the person or I'll find the person for you who can, who can give that answer or who can, you know, identify if a piece of wood is worth using. Um, but yeah, this is your first, you know, this is the, this is such a, a fun, I love the wood shop. I mean, that's why I joined Bank Haven originally. And there's just like so much fun stuff you can do. You can do utilitarian stuff. You can do artsy stuff. You can do, you know, and eventually you'll start to get to know the other machines and the other areas and see how you can combine stuff. But I don't know, calm down, Ashley. Um, you know, but just, yeah, find something, find an idea and maybe you do that box. That's great, you know, um, something that, you know, we have suggested, I have a list of like links to different projects as well that I'll pull up that people can look at and just whatever, something that seems like fun. Don't feel like there's any pressure. There's the goal of this unit and every single unit in foundations is to like get into the shop, get into the area, touch some stuff, get used to it, have fun with it. So that's that's it. Yeah. Next. Ignore those times. I didn't update those. Um, so those are, you know what, those are pretty standard. That's actually Saturday's Glenn. Uh, Wednesday is Jorge at least. And you, right? You're, 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 Thursday is, I don't know, who's 12 to 3 on Thursdays? I don't remember. I know Adam. 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 He's on vacation for the next couple of weeks, but you'll meet him eventually. Um, you know, these are, those are times when woodshop facilitators are in yeah, poke around the, don't feel like you need to remember everything I just said, or Jared said, or Corey said, feel free to forget. Two thirds of it, minimum. That's totally fine. <laughs> Especially the parts, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, any questions, thoughts? Yeah. Um, I don't know the name of this machine, but like the, the one that like cuts the wood automatically, like Kind of like a CNC, but yeah, the Gerber and the Shapoko. Oh, okay. That's yeah, what it is. yeah, we have two yeah. of them in the in the wood shop. Um, those are we, uh, those are great. Do the Shapoko first of the two. Um, and there's the Carbide Three D, the company that makes the Shapoko, actually has really good videos. If you like, already know that's the road you want to go down. 
just go down their tutorial rabbit hole and it's it's surprisingly approachable. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we'll get into CNC stuff down the line, um, but that shouldn't stop you from doing it now. There's no, feel free. That's, you know, I'm just gonna kind of feel free to jump ahead if you're like really interested in some other part of Make Haven and you wanna start getting badged on stuff beforehand, don't feel like you have to like, you can read ahead in the book. Nobody's <laughs> nobody's gonna be mad. That's absolutely, um, yeah. And I bet you we went way longer. You know what? Not as bad as I thought.